Part three of Chapter seven of A Student's History of American Literature by William Simons. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part three Contemporary Fiction. To take adequate account of our contemporary American fiction would require far more space than is available in this book, nor has the time yet come to attempt an estimate of literary values in this interesting field. Hardly more than a list of the most prominent among our present-day novelists can be included, with a partial classification of their work although it is in fiction that american writers are now most prolific and most successful it is doubtful if many of these works will find a place in the literature which endures or if any of these popular novelists will be long remembered two schools of fiction are represented the realistic and the romantic it is not always easy to discriminate however and there are writers who have used the methods of both schools william dean howells a consistent and uncompromising representative of the claims of realism is recognized as easily the foremost american novelist in this generation his father was a country editor and it was in a printing office in his native state of ohio that mr howells received his literary training the publication, with John J. Piat of Poems of Two Friends, 1860, marked the beginning of his career. A campaign, Life of Lincoln, in the same year, secured his appointment to counsel to Venice, a position which he held for four years. Venetian Life, 1866, and Italian Journeys, 1867, were the fruit of foreign residents. In 1866, Mr. Howells was made assistant editor, under James T. Fields, of the Atlantic Monthly, and from 1871 to 1881, he was the editor of the magazine. A vivacious novel, Their Wedding Journey, 1871, added to the reputation already gained by the two Italian books, and this was increased by the stories which followed. A Chance Acquaintance 1873, and A Foregone Conclusion, 1874. Mr. Howells is the author of more than thirty volumes, mainly works of fiction. Of these, A Modern Instance, 1882, The Rise of Silas Lapham, 1885, and A Hazard of New Fortunes, 1889, have probably aroused widest interest. Mr. Howell's literary workmanship is deserving of the highest praise. He is minutely conscientious in his studies of character and incident, insisting upon careful observation and an honest report. His theory of literary art is set forth in an interesting essay, Criticism and Fiction, 1891. Since 1881, the novelist has been associated editorially with various periodicals, including Harper's Magazine. While fiction predominates in his published writings, he has written a number of humorous parlor plays, several volumes of essays upon literary themes, and not a small amount of very charming verse. Henry James is a native of New York, and is properly denominated an American writer, although since 1869 he has made his home in England. His novels are usually associated with those of Mr. Howells as exemplifying the best work of the American realists. In Mr. James' narratives, we find the extreme application of realistic theory, along with an analysis of character and motive, wonderfully minute. His novels and short stories are psychological studies, for the most part, and have a comparatively small audience among American readers. As the novelist was at one time fond of presenting studies of his countrymen, as they sometimes appear in Europe, in the environment of a superior culture, his work has often aroused protest rather than favor here. Such was the reception given to Daisy Miller, 1878. 
Others of the novels which are eminently characteristic of this author are An International Episode, 1879, The Bostonians, 1886, The Princess, Casa Massima, 1886, The Tragic Muse, 1890, and What Maisie Knew, 1897. It is in the craftsmanship and structure of his narratives that Mr. James commands most general admiration. This artistic skill, along with his keen wit and general brilliance of style, may be most advantageously studied in some of the short stories, which constitute a large portion of his fiction, as, for example, in Terminations, 1896, or The Private Life and Other Stories, 1893. Naturally, the realistic novelists have, in the selection of material, frequently turned to the study of characters and manners with which their environment has made them well acquainted. There has, therefore, developed a large group of story writers who deal with local types. Following the footsteps of Harriet Beecher Stowe in the delineation of the quiet New England life, Sarah Orne Jewett, 1849 to 1909, published the placid but impressive little story Deephaven in 1877. Miss Jewett's work in this field has been sympathetic as well as accurate and her novels have appealed strongly to the affections of many readers. Of these, A Country Doctor, 1884, A Marsh Island, 1885, and The Country of the Pointed Furs, 1896, may be mentioned. Elizabeth Stewart Phelps Ward, born at Boston, 1844, became widely known by the publication of two mystical novels, The Gates Ajar, 1868, and Men, Women, and Ghosts, 1869. The daughter of a noted theologian and reared in the serious atmosphere of Andover, Mrs. Ward has given a distinctly religious coloring to her numerous works, of which The Story of Avis, 1877, Beyond the Gates, 1883, The Madonna of the Tubs, 1886, Jack the Fisherman, 1887, the Gates Between, 1887, A Singular Life, 1894, and The Supply at St. Agatha's, 1896, are important examples. Margaret Wade Deland, born in Pennsylvania, 1857, whose residence since 1880 has been at Boston, also touched the field of religious experience in her first novel, John Ward, Preacher, published in 1888. Philip and His Wife, 1894, Sydney, 1890, The Common Way, 1904, and The Awakening of Helena Ritchie, 1906, are the most notable of her later works. Perhaps the most distinguished success in realistic fiction is found in the work of Mary E. Wilkins Freeman, born in Massachusetts, 1862. Mrs. Freeman has portrayed with great skill and intense feeling the more subdued yet rugged phases of New England life and character. Her short stories are of exceptional strength and exhibit the technical methods of realism in perfection. A Humble Romance, 1887. A New England Nun, 1891. Jane Field, 1892. Pembroke. 1894, and Jerome, 1897, may be cited as examples. Alice Brown, born in New Hampshire, 1857, has been especially successful in her short stories, such as are gathered under the titles Meadowgrass, 1895, Tiverton Tales, 1899, and The County Road, 1906. Closely akin in local color to the work of Mrs. Freeman, these tales admit a little more of the brightness and warmth of the New England sunshine as it creeps along the shadows of humble circumstances. A later novel, The Story of Thirza, 1908, is a work of genuine creative power. There are other well-known writers of fiction who belong to New England, at least by birth, whose work does not permit of such 
definite classification as that of the group just considered. It is not concerned with the local type. Here belongs the name of Jane G. Austen, 1831 to 1894, whose historical novels, Standish of Standish, 1889, Betty Alden, 1891, etc., deal with old colony times. Harriet Prescott Spofford, born in Maine, 1835, is the author of numerous romantic tales, beginning with Sir Rohan's Ghost, 1859. Her most recent novels include Priscilla's Love Story, 1898, The Maid He Married, 1899, and The Great Procession, 1902. Ellen Olney Kirk, born in Connecticut, 1842, published her first novel, Love in Idleness, in 1877. She has written a score of popular stories, including Through Winding Ways, 1880, The Story of Margaret Kent, 1886, Sons and Daughters, 1887, The Apology of Aleph, 1904, and Marcia, 1907. Blanche Willis Howard, 1847 to 1898, a native of Maine, became the wife of Dr. von Tuffel of Stuttgart, in Württemberg, in 1890. She died at Munich. Her first story, One Summer, A Delicate Idol, appeared in 1875. Gwen, A Breton Romance, in 1882. Clara Louise Burnham, born in Massachusetts, 1854, is the daughter of Dr. George F. Root, the composer. She has been the author of numerous works of fiction, beginning with No Gentleman, in 1881. Among her later novels, which deal largely with the teachings of Christian science, the most successful are The Wise Woman, 1895, The Right Princess, 1902, and Jewel, 1903. Arthur Sherburn Hardy, born in Massachusetts, 1847, a graduate of West Point and at one time professor of mathematics in Dartmouth College, has written several novels of unusual charm and strength these are but yet a woman 1883 the wind of destiny 1886 pass rose 1889 and his daughter first 1903 mr hardy was editor of the cosmopolitan magazine 1893 to 1895 and has served as diplomatic representative of the united states in the orient in switzerland and in Spain. Edward Bellamy, 1850 to 1898, is best known by two popular studies in political economy, presented through the medium of romance, Looking Backward, 1888, and Equality, 1897. Robert Grant, born at Boston, 1852, a jurist, is well known as a writer of stimulating essays and an author of several successful novels. He has found American society a fruitful field for his realistic studies, of which the most prominent are An Average Man, 1883, The Carltons, 1891, Unleavened Bread, 1900, The Undercurrent, 1904, and The Chippendales, 1909. Frederick J. Stimson, born in Massachusetts, 1855, like Judge Grant, a representative of the legal profession, wrote his earlier novels under the pen name J. S. of Dale, Gurndale, 1882, King Noanet, 1896, and In Cure of Her Soul, 1906, are representative works. Edward Everett Hale, 1822 to 1909, an indefatigable gleaner in many fields, won merited fame with his story, now classic, The Man Without a Country, which appeared in The Atlantic Monthly in 1863. A long series of tales and narratives, mostly with a purpose, includes the novel Philip Nolan's Friends, 1876, and the religious romance In His Name, 1873. John Townsend Trowbridge, born in New York, 1827, has been, since 1848, a resident of Boston or its suburbs. He, too, is a representative of the earlier generation, whose works were popular with old and young. 
His best-known novels are Neighbor Jackwood, 1857, and Cujo's Cave, 1863. The narrative of Jack Hazard and His Fortunes, 1871, began as a series of entertaining stories for boys, which long maintained their place in the affections of the New England youth. Indeed, juvenile fiction flourished early in New England. The famous Rolla and Lucy of Jacob Abbott, 1803 to 1879, which began to appear about 1840, are now recalled as quaint examples of the old-fashioned children's books in which instruction was generously mixed with entertainment the jack hazard books were of a different type and were the delight of the younger generation that followed so were the elm island stories written by rev elijah kellogg eighteen thirteen to nineteen o one like jacob abbott a native of maine mrs adeline d t whitney eighteen twenty four to nineteen o six author of faith gartney's girlhood eighteen sixty three leslie goldthwaite and we girls eighteen seventy and louisa m alcott eighteen thirty two to eighteen eighty eight were the most popular writers for girls silas weir mitchell born at philadelphia eighteen thirty a distinguished physician after several essays in fiction became famous as a novelist with the publication of Hugh Wynne in 1897. This was the beginning in the recent revival of interest in the historical novel dealing with the American Revolution. It has its sequel in The Red City, 1908. Francis R. Stockton, 1884 to 1902, a native of Philadelphia, best known, perhaps, as the author of The Lady or the Tiger, 1884 is unique among american story writers for the whimsical mingling of the serious and the humorous in fiction his first notable work was rudder grange eighteen seventy nine which one hardly knows whether to classify as a novel or as a romance but its very original vein of humor is delicious and runs through all of stockton's succeeding work mrs amelia edith barr born in england eighteen thirty one since 1869 a resident of new york state has been the prolific author of more than thirty works of fiction including jan vedder's wife 1885 the black shilling the bow of orange ribbon 1886 etc jalmar jorth boyson 1848 to 1895 is another successful american novelist not american born he was a native of Norway. After coming to this country, he filled professorships at Cornell and Columbia. Gunnar, a Norse romance, his first novel, appeared in 1874. Edgar Fawcett, 1847 to 1904, also a writer of verse, wrote novels depicting some phases of society in New York. Among these are An Ambitious Woman, 1883, Social Silhouettes, 1885, the House at High Bridge, 1886. Brander Matthews, born at New Orleans, 1852, since 1892 a professor at Columbia, a well-known essayist and critic, has written realistic studies, both novels and short stories, of New York life. Such are included in the volumes Vignettes of Manhattan, 1894, His Father's Son, 1895, and A Confident Tomorrow, 1899. Harold Frederick, 1856 to 1898, a New York journalist and foreign correspondent at the time of his death, is best remembered by his strong, purposeful novel, The Damnation of Theron Ware, 1896. Francis Marion Crawford, 1854 to 1909, most cosmopolitan of American writers, both in residence and in the material utilized in his novels, was also one of the most productive of recent novelists. He was the son of the sculptor, Thomas C. Crawford, and was born in Italy. His education was attained at St. Paul's School in Concord, New Hampshire, at Trinity College, Cambridge, at Heidelberg, and Rome. During 1879 and 1880, he engaged in editorial work in India, 
although his residence was for the rest of his life in Italy, he remained strongly patriotic in his sentiment toward the United States, regarding it as his country and asserting himself always an American. His first novel, Mr. Isaacs, appeared in 1882, and was followed by Dr. Claudius, 1883, A Roman Singer, 1884, Zoroaster, 1885, and A Tale of a Lonely Parish, 1886. The variety of sources from which Mr. Crawford drew his material is strikingly suggested in the titles of his representative novels, of which the following may be mentioned. Paul Patoff, 1887, Saracenesca, 1884, Greifenstein, 1889, Calette, 1891, Pietro Gisleri, 1893, Catherine Lauderdale, 1894, In the Palace of the King, 1900, A Lady of Rome, 1906, Arathusa, 1907. He was the author of more than forty books, including important studies of Italian history and several plays. Of his novels it is conceded that those depicting Italian life and character are the most valuable, and of these three, consisting of the Saracenesca series, are the best. Mr. Crawford died at his villa in Sorrento at the age of fifty-five. Kate Douglas Wiggin, now Mrs. Riggs, born at Philadelphia, 1857, published her first notable story, The Bird's Christmas Carol, in 1888, and The Story of Patsy, in 1889. Of her subsequent stories, Rebecca, 1903, has perhaps had the largest success. The well-known character Penelope first appeared in Penelope's English Experiences, 1893. Of the present-day novelists in the Eastern group, Mrs. Edith Wharton, born at New York, 1862, holds a place of distinction based largely upon her intensely realistic novels, The House of Mirth, 1905, and The Fruit of the Tree, 1907. Owen Wister, born at Philadelphia, 1860, is known as the author of The Virginian, 1902. Richard Harding Davis, born in Philadelphia, 1864, a journalist by profession and famed as a war correspondent, is one of the most popular short story writers of the day. The creator of Gallagher and Van Bibber, and author of several popular romances, among which are The King's Jackal, 1898, Soldiers of Fortune, 1899, and The White Mice, 1909. Robert W. Chambers, born at Brooklyn, 1865, is another popular writer of romantic tales, of which Lorraine, 1896, and The Fighting Chance, 1906, are examples. Here also should be included two representatives of this younger set, whose work had aroused wide interest when interrupted by their death. Paul Leister Ford, 1865 to 1902, author of The Honorable Peter Sterling, and Janice Meredith, 1899, and Stephen Crane, 1871 to 1900, a young New York journalist who wrote a remarkable, realistic study of battle, The Red Badge of Courage, 1896. The Southern states are well represented in the fiction which depicts local types of character, and have, besides, produced novelists of note whose work is more general in its scope. Similar to the work of some of the New England realists is that of Richard Malcolm Johnston, 1822-1898, whose novels and tales portray the picturesque manners prevailing in portions of his native state. Old Mark Langston, 1883, The Primes and Their Neighbors, 1891, Pierce Amerson's Will, and Old Times in Middle Georgia, 1897, are examples. Joel Chandler Harris, 1848 to 1908, for 25 years editor of the Atlanta Constitution, has worked in the same field. Balaam and His Master, 1891, On the Plantation, 1892, Stories of Georgia, The Story of Aaron, Tales of the Home Folks, 
are the titles of other well-known volumes. But it is as Uncle Remus, teller of tales, concerning Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox, that this author is most widely known. Uncle Remus, His Songs and His Sayings, was published in 1880. Told by Uncle Remus appeared in 1905, and almost the last publication of this writer was a volume entitled Uncle Remus and Br'er Rabbit, 1907. Thomas Nelson Page, born in Virginia, 1853, has written stories which have their scene in the Old Dominion. Among them are, in Old Virginia, 1887, Two Little Confederates, 1888, Milady, Marse Chan, a later novel, Red Rock, appeared in 1898. James Lane Allen, born in Kentucky, 1849, is less of a realist than an idealist. The idyllic quality appears predominant in A Kentucky Cardinal, 1894, and its sequel, Aftermath, 1896. The Chair Invisible, 1897, and The Reign of Law, 1900 are historical romances depicting early life in the state. Mr. Allen's style is distinguished by unusual literary charm. More distinctive studies of local types are found in the realistic novels of John Fox, Jr., born in Kentucky, 1862, A Mountain Europa, 1894, Hell for Sartain, 1896, and The Kentuckians, 1897, introduced Mr. Fox to readers of fiction. More recently have appeared The Little Shepherd of Kingdom Come, 1903, and The Trail of the Lonesome Pine, 1908. Mary Noelles Murphy, born in Tennessee, 1850, for some years successfully concealed her identity under the pen name Charles Egbert Craddock. In the Tennessee Mountains, 1884, the Prophet of the Great Smoky Mountain, 1885, and In the Clouds, 1886, began a series of strong and interesting tales of the mountain whites, a class which Miss Murphy has continued to depict in her later works. The touch of the Romanticist is evident in the work of George Washington Cable, born at New Orleans, 1844. Although Mr. Cable has been a resident of Massachusetts for many years, his stories belong to the Southland, Old Creole Days, 1879, The Grandissimes, 1880, Madame Dauphine, 1881, Dr. Sevier, 1885, and Bonaventure, 1888, are representative works. Ruth McHenry Stewart, born in Louisiana, 1856, has depicted with keen sense of humor some phases of southern life, both white and black. A Golden Wedding and Other Tales appeared in 1893, Carlotta's Intended and The Story of Babette, 1894, were followed by Sunny, 1896, a unique and fascinating character study. The Reconstructed Negro appears in the later creations of Napoleon Jackson, 1902, and George Washington Jones, 1908. The River's Children, 1904, is a genuine idol of the Mississippi. Grace Elizabeth King, born at New Orleans, 1852, has written of the Creoles in Monsieur Mott, 1888, Tales of Time and Place, 1892, and Balcony Stories, 1893. Francis Hodgson Burnett, born at Manchester, England, 1849, removed to the United States in 1865, residing for ten years in Tennessee, and then for a period in Washington, D.C. Mrs. Burnett's first novels, That Last, A Lowry's, 1877, and Haworth's, 1879, portray life among the working people of Lancashire. Her Through One Administration, 1883, deals with official society life in Washington. Little Lord Fauntleroy, 1886, was an exceedingly popular juvenile, which was followed by others almost as successful. Mrs. Burnett has lived of late years in England. 
A lady of quality appeared in 1896, the shuttle in 1907. Amelie Reeves, Princess Trubetskoy, born at Richmond, Virginia, 1863, owes her literary reputation largely to her first novel, The Quick or the Dead, published in 1888. A Brother to Dragons appeared the same year. Perhaps the best known of our writers from the South is Francis Hopkinson Smith, born at Baltimore, 1838, a versatile master of several arts, including the substantial one of building lighthouses. His first success in fiction was the fine character sketch Colonel Carter of Cartersville, 1891. Tom Grogan, 1896, Caleb West, 1898, and The Tides of Barnegat, 1906, are all realistic studies of the people whom the author may have known when living the practical business life of a building contractor and mechanical engineer. The Fortunes of Oliver Horn, 1902, is said to be reminiscent of that period in Mr. Smith's life when he was an art student in New York. His recent stories, The Romance of an Old-Fashioned Gentleman, 1907, and Peter, 1908, indicate a return to the more sentimental manner of his earliest successes. Albion W. Corgi, 1838-1905, a native of Ohio and an officer in the Union Army throughout the Civil War, lived in North Carolina from 1865 to 1881, and during this period wrote three or four novels dealing with political conditions in the South. Of these, A Fool's Errand, 1879, and Bricks Without Straw, 1880, aroused widespread interest. Torget afterwards served as United States Consul at Bordeaux, and at Halifax, and was the author of numerous stories and novels. Among the younger writers who are natives of the South, three have a special distinction as successful novelists in the broader field of fiction. Mary Johnston, born in Virginia, 1870, has written three historical romances dealing with old colony times in Virginia, Prisoners of Hope, 1898, To Have and to Hold, 1900, and Sir Mortimer, 1904. In Lewis Rand, 1908, Miss Johnston presents a picturesque study of political life at the opening of the 19th century. The Goddess of Reason, 1907, is a notable drama on the theme of the French Revolution. Winston Churchill, born at St. Louis, 1871, has taken a conspicuous place among writers of historical romance, with his impressive series dealing with great epochs in American history. Richard Carvel, 1899, The Crisis, 1901, and The Crossing, 1904. To these novels must be added his first story, The Celebrity, 1898, and his later work, Coniston, 1906. Ellen A. G. Glasgow, born at Richmond, Virginia, 1874, is the author of three realistic novels of unusual power, The Descendant, 1897, The Deliverance, 1904, and The Wheel of Life, 1906. The Promise of the West as a field for the writer of fiction came with the publication of The Hoosier Schoolmaster, 1871. This book was a realistic study of character in southern Indiana, of the early fifties. Its author, Edward Eggleston, 1837 to 1902, was born in the pioneer days of the state at the little town of Vevey on the Ohio River. He entered the ministry of the Methodist Church and became what was then known as a circuit rider, ministering to a parish which required a four weeks itinerary, involving both hardship and peril. In six months, his health broke down and he removed to Minnesota. In 1886, he engaged in editorial work at Chicago, and in 1874 became pastor of a church in Brooklyn, New York, to which he gave the name of the Church of Christian Endeavor. The Hoosier Schoolmaster met with wide popularity and was translated into several languages. It was followed by The Mystery of Metropolisville, 1873, 
with its setting in Minnesota, and The Circuit Rider, 1874, the scene of which is laid in Ohio. Rosie, 1878, and The Graysons, 1887, are again portrayals of Hoosier types. The state of Indiana has made a remarkable record in the literary history of the Middle West. Lew Wallace, 1827-1905, to the author of Ben-Hur, was a native of the state and made his home at Crawfordsville, the Hoosier Athens. He served in the Mexican War and later in the Civil War, receiving the rank of Major General for gallantry in the field. His first romance, The Fair God, 1873, was an Aztec story, the inspiration of which came from the reading of Prescott's histories. Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, 1880, was the result of a conscientious study of the foundations of the Christian faith. The author's treatment of his difficult subject is scholarly and reverent. The popularity of the work has fairly rivaled that of Uncle Tom's Cabin. General Wallace was appointed governor of New Mexico in 1878, and it was while living at Santa Fe that he wrote the larger part of the romance. A later story, The Prince of India, 1893, was an outcome of Wallace's residence at Constantinople as minister to Turkey. Maurice Thompson, 1844 to 1901, also a resident of Crawfordsville, has been mentioned already as a writer of verse. He was a novelist as well, the author of several popular stories, of which A Tallahassee Girl, 1882, and Alice of Old Vincennes, 1900, are noteworthy. Among more recent writers who have added to the literary reputation of the Hoosier state are Newton Booth Tarkington, born 1869, author of The Gentleman from Indiana, Monsieur Beaucaire, 1900, The Two Van Revels, 1902, Cherry, 1903, The Conquest of Cannon, 1905, etc. Charles Major, 1856 to 1913, whose very popular romance, When Knighthood Was in Flower, appeared in 1898. Meredith Nicholson, born 1866, author of several romantic narratives, of which The House of a Thousand Candles, 1905, and The Port of Missing Men, 1907, are prominent, and George Barr McCutcheon, born 1866, whose Grostark, 1900, Craney Crow, 1902, and Beverly of Grostart, 1904, are best known. Here also should be included the name of the versatile humorist George Ade, born 1866, whose first literary successes, Artie, Pink Marsh, Doc Horn, etc., were produced while Mr. Ade was writing on the staff of a Chicago newspaper, 1890 to 1900. Captain Charles King, Born at Albany, New York, 1844, now living at Milwaukee, a retired army officer, is the author of a long list of tales, the material of which is mainly drawn from military life. These include The Colonel's Daughter, 1883, The Deserter, 1887, Captain Blake, 1892, The General's Double, 1897, and many more. Constance Fenimore Wilson, 1848 to 1894, a descendant of James Fenimore Cooper, was born in New Hampshire, but her home in later life was at Cleveland, Ohio. Her summers were usually spent on the shores of Lake Superior or at Mackinac. She resided also in Florida. Her principal novels are Castle Nowhere, 1875, Anne, 1882, East Angels, 1886, and Jupiter Lights, 1889. Mary Halleck Foote, born in New York, 1847, lived for some years in Colorado, California, and Idaho, accompanying her husband, a civil engineer. Her most successful novels deal realistically with the life of the mining camp and the hills. These are The Lead Horse Claim, 1883, John Baldwin's 
Testimony, 1886, and Cour de Lignes, 1894. Mary Hartwell Catherwood, 1847-1902, to a native of Ohio, later a resident of Illinois, was the author of several interesting historical novels for the most part concerned with historic epochs in the region of the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes, and in the valleys of the Mississippi and the Illinois. It was The Romance of Dollard, 1889, which began the series of her works, a series which owed its inception to the fascinating narratives of Francis Parkman. Old Kakaskia, 1893, and The White Islander, 1893, The Lady of Fort St. John, 1892, and The Little Renault, 1897, are vigorous narratives of romantic adventure. Mrs. Catherwood's last work, Lazar, 1901, is based on the tradition which identifies the Dolphin of France, who disappeared mysteriously from Paris at the outbreak of the Revolution, with a lad in America who went by the name of Eleazar Williams, and was reputed of royal birth. Alice French, Octave Thanet, born in Massachusetts, 1850, is a resident of Davenport, Iowa. A part of the year she makes her home in a quiet spot in Arkansas. Both places serve as setting in some of her stories. Miss French is a realist. The relations between labor and capital have proved interesting and effective material in her hands. Among her works are Knitters in the Sun, 1887, Expiation, 1890, Otto the Night, 1893, Stories of a Western Town, 1893, the Heart of Toil, 1898, and The Man of the Hour, 1905. Henry Blake Fuller, born at Chicago, 1857, has ably represented the Western metropolis in modern fiction, beginning his literary career with two fantastic romances, The Chevalier of Pensieri Vani, 1891, and The Chatelaine of La Trinité. Mr. Fuller, 1892, next appeared as a realistic novelist of keen vision and serious purpose. He portrayed some phases of Chicago society in The Cliff Dwellers, 1893, and With the Procession, 1895. Mr. Fuller's latest work, The Last Refuge, 1901, is in line with his earlier volumes, romantic, whimsical, and strongly symbolistic. Hamlin Garland, born in Wisconsin, 1860, for a time resident in the East, but now identified with Chicago, is a realist in principle, although some of his more recent work is softened by touches of romanticism. Mr. Garland's first publication, Main Traveled Roads, 1890, was a volume of short stories realistic and somewhat cynical in tone. Jason Edwards, 1891, A Little Norsk, 1891, A Spoil of Office, 1892, A Member of the Third House, 1892, and Rose of Dutcher's Cooley, 1895, followed in similar vein. The Eagle's Heart, 1900, Her Mountain Lover, 1901, The Captain of the Grey Horse Troop, 1902, and Hesper, 1903, are all stories of the rugged, unconventional life of mountain, mine, and camp, in which romance blends with realism. Will Payne, born in Illinois, 1865, since 1890 a Chicago journalist and for several years editor of The Economist, is the author of numerous short stories and of several novels. Jerry the Dreamer was published in 1896. The Story of Eva in 1901. Two of Mr. Payne's realistic novels, The Money Captain, 1898, and Mr. Salt, 1903, are distinctively studies of commercial life, 
and admirable essays in this field robert herrick born at cambridge massachusetts eighteen sixty eight a harvard man and since eighteen ninety three a member of the faculty in the university of chicago holds a leading place among western realists like mr fuller he has been impressed by certain phases of american social life and has written somewhat sombre but carefully studied narratives which have their setting in the great city of the middle west these include the gospel of freedom eighteen ninety eight the web of life nineteen hundred the common lot nineteen o four and together nineteen o eight one of the youngest and one of the most promising in this group of western realists was frank norris eighteen seventy to nineteen o two mr norris was born at chicago but part of his life was spent on the pacific coast and another portion of it in new york he was a journalist and served as war correspondent in south africa and cuba at the time of his death he was a resident in california mr norris's claim to distinction is found in a projected series of three novels planned to embody his great idea what he called the epic of the wheat the octopus is the first of the series and deals with the planting and harvesting of the crop its scene is laid in southern california the pit nineteen o three pictures the selling of the wheat and dramatically portrays the life which centers in the chicago board of trade the last book of the trilogy was to have dealt with the distribution of the wheat in europe and would have been entitled the wolf as symbolizing the experiences of famine in russia although uncompleted the large conception of this young enthusiast is worthy of more than passing note while his actual achievement is in itself remarkable end of part three of chapter seven end of chapter seven and end of a student's history of american literature by william simons